All right. Welcome everyone. Uh, post lunch sessions are generally the hardest uh, in any conference. Uh, I hope you had a good lunch and I hope nobody falls asleep. It's a small enough room. We'll catch you, we'll shake you, we'll wake you up uh, and we'll ask you some questions about the presentation uh, if you fall asleep. Just joke, jokes aside, uh, a quick introduction to the talk. Uh, it's called, it's Aptos Advantage. Um, so Aptos, this is like our first big event in India. Thanks to Naresh, who's uh, standing right here. He's driving a lot of, uh, lot of this event and coordination. Um, so we are going to go do a technical deep dive on the entire Aptos stack. And what is unique, like there are lots of L1s and L2s uh, across the board as you develop on all of these technologies. I want to give you a very thorough Aptos introduction and tell you how Aptos is unique in different, uh, all through the stack. Uh, thank you. A quick introduction of myself. My name is Pranav Raval. I manage the core blockchain and research teams at Aptos. I uh, joined in April 22, so Aptos formed in February 22, so just right after it was formed. Before that, I was the uh, head of batch compute for all of Facebook's analytics. Uh, and we processed, uh, my teams processed more than 1.5 exabyte of data every day. And to be honest, I still don't know how many zeros are there in that number. Uh, but I'm very stoked to bring Aptos to India because it's been my passion project. Uh, India's amazing talent pool. Uh, developers are building for all the global use cases and uh, uh, great to be here. All right, quick introduction about Aptos. I know you guys all know, quickly touch upon, created at Facebook, at Meta. Uh, it was one of Zuck's pet projects to build this for a global community, billions of people. Uh, at some point, the paths diverged. Uh, the team decided to take it uh, to the market on our own. Uh, we launched in February 2022. We raised more than $400 million from A16Z to all the big names in crypto. Um, before the AI wave started, we are like the largest seed round ever. Um, and Mainnet was launched in October 22. We are just over a year old at this point from Mainnet point of view. And we have seen some amazing traction already. Thank you. So we have three, we have processed 300 million plus transactions, 700 million plus addresses have been created, 200 plus, I think the number is 300 plus now, we have 120 nodes in mainnet. All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll start to kind of talk about some of the, um, like the reason why we are here, we being the Aptos team. And the Aptos mission is to create universal and fair access to decentralized assets for billions of people. All right, the Aptos mission, one word, that sounds great, but what does it mean? Okay, it means we build a platform that supports billions of transactions, hundreds of millions of users, tens of thousands of apps, thousands of developers, and hundreds of tens of product verticals. So again, that sounds good, but how? So we are gonna now split it into different sections. So we have four, three or four uh, core uh, kind of split uh, of mission into how we take it from engineering point of view. So we are gonna build infra, which is at part with Web2. So there are a lot of, uh, Web3 infra is still struggling to catch up with the providing the same experience that an end user is very familiar in the Web2 infra and the how the cloud scale works. Uh, we are what we want to build. We wanted to build a secure language, uh, the language that is built for Web3 from design from scratch. You design this new language called Move that I'm sure you have heard of. Um, we are building it, and then also we want to make sure that the, we build rich interfaces on top of it. Once that foundation is laid, we want to build differentiating capabilities. We believe that Web3 should not be, users should not come to Web3 just because it's Web3. Users should come to Web3 because there are new capabilities that we are providing that is not available in Web2 applications. And the last one is that in our community, we want to build individual partnerships. Either you are a developer or you are a big enterprise. You should get same experience working with Haptos. And you should feel like you are getting individual attention and you are getting individual support. All right. And in summary, so that's what we call the Aptos advantage. And we'll go into the more details. So uh, before we go into this slide, uh, I want to just kind of understand the audience a little bit better. Uh, who in the audience uh, who are uh, developers and write code actively? Okay, more, almost half, maybe more than half. All right, and who has written any code on move? One, two, three, and maybe three or four. Okay, great. So I think, yeah, this gives me some idea that we, yes, we have a lot of developers, but very new to move and kind of uh, also uh, maybe somewhat new to Aptos overall. Okay, sounds good. All right, cool. So the Aptos advantage is full stack, starting from the bottom most layer of infra, then language, 
then frameworks, and then core capabilities that we talked about. All right, so one layer at a time, we are gonna dive deeper into it. Um, I'm thinking, almost thinking, that we are gonna hold on to the questions towards the end. Uh, but if you just kind of completely uh, just not following and you want to really understand, please let me know. We can quickly take a question here and there, but uh, otherwise I would prefer taking them in the end. All right, so what is the infra? It is our entire blockchain network that runs decentralized globally. Um, we have this validator nodes. They all talk to each other. They only talk to full node because validators node, nodes are not accessible to the outer world. Next, please. All right, if you unpack the validator node, there are three different layers. There is consensus, there is execution, and there is storage. So uh, Aptos team, uh, the core team uh, comes from Facebook uh, and has played a very important role in building out and scaling out Facebook's infrastructure, Facebook and Instagram both. And one of the things that we learned is to scale out, to take maximum utilization of the resources that are provided to you, you have to build an architecture that is pipelined and modular. That means that when the one phase is going on, the other phase is processing as well. And so consensus, execution, and storage kind of goes in parallel. Uh, so let's understand consensus at a high level. Consensus is the heart of any blockchain. Uh, generally, consensus at the end of the consensus phase, you have a block with ordered transaction. There are a lot of inefficient um, inefficiency is a, uh, there are a lot of Web3 latencies kind of come from consensus phase because you all of these nodes have to agree on a certain order. Uh, even if you look at Web2 and you think about Paxos and Raft and some of the consensus protocol, um, they have been fine-tuned over many, many years. Um, so one of the early bottleneck in consensus was uh, when a leader has to make a proposal for the block. So leader has to collect all the data, collect all the transaction, put it in a block, then it sends it to the entire network. And the whole the network then collects all the data and then they view it and they say, yes, I agree with it. I sign it, then sends a signature back. So you see so many round trips, so many communication. And they, as the data packet is heavier, it takes more time. So if you start building large blocks, you start seeing more and more latencies in your blockchain. So what we did was something called Quorum Store. It does continuous transaction dissemination. As globally you are getting transaction, the transactions are seamlessly getting passed to the entire network. All leader does is it takes the metadata, just transaction IDs maybe for now, we can say, and then creates a block and sends it to everybody. So it's a very, very lightweight packet. So very quickly, the data is already available locally. So this gave us two to three X boost in our total throughput of the system. So this is consensus quorum store. Next slide, please. The state of the art in consensus is DAG-based protocols. So DAG-based protocols kind of completely remove the leader, the whole leader, Premise itself kind of goes away with DAG. It's, this is a very, very interesting topic. I would love to go into a lot of details, but uh, right now we are just going to be high level. But I really, if you're interested, you should read up on this because DAG-based consensus is the latest and greatest. And it kind of turns the whole consensus thing upside down. When I first came, up, came across the idea, I was, I was very amazed that uh, I think Hadera came up with this idea, Hashgraph, in the originally, right? And then... Bullshark is the latest, again, the latest currently. Uh, Aptos research team, Sasha Spiegelman, uh, he's in the research team. Uh, I work closely with him. He's the lead author on Bullshark. Bullshark with the DAG based protocol has introduced a lot of opportunity to increase throughput, but it had a side effect of latency. It introduced also for further round trips. Again, I will not go into the details right now, but the next iteration on Bullshark is called Shoal, where we are taking away a bunch of those round trip latencies. And now Bullshark is at par with the leader, leader based protocol at par with that latency and we are working on further things. So that is going to further reduction in latency is coming up soon. So we are going to be even faster. So DAG based consensus protocol being faster than leader based consensus protocol is going to be a huge win for the industry overall. All right, cool. So um, can you go back one more slide? Yeah, one more slide. Uh, go back. Uh, yeah, one uh, further. So, uh, one more, one more. Sorry, I think I'm missing a slide or maybe go back one last one. Yeah, let's let's stay here. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. Thank you for. Uh, yeah, okay. All right. So I think the summary is like for uh, consensus, which is generally gets equated with any blockchain core technology. Aptos has a very has been established as a very clear leader. All of our consensus protocols are also proven. Like I said, generally, there is a recent conversation with Solana as proof of history. 
is it like proven and has the right specification. Uh, so Aptos has research papers published and it's all uh, proven protocol. All right, so post consensus, there is a, an infra, there is execution. Uh, execution is just take the transaction. They think about a transaction is just doing a peer to peer payment. You have to uh, reduce the amount from uh, account from and add the amount to account to. You have to make sure if there's a conflict, if you are trying to pay multiple people at the same time, you have to take it, the conflict into account. You have to make sure it happens in the right sequence. You produce the output uh, and that is called the execution phase. Where we have a new technology called block STM, software transactional memory has been around for a long time, has never been used in this way. So it infers parallelism without programmer assistance. So this is a very key concept because it doesn't remain back in the infra. It goes all the way to developer experience because when you try to get parallelism, the conflict is something that you really need to take into account. And what a lot of chains do is that they ask the developer to say for your transaction, give us all of your dependencies, all the read write sets that you depend on, all the objects you depend on, declare them upfront. And if you touch anything else, we are gonna fail you. And if you see that those objects are not touching uh, each other, then you go in parallel, right? So they, it's more the chains put the onus on the developer to say, tell us what you are interested in. Aptos has taken a completely separate approach. It said, we are going to infer this at runtime, make developers life easy. You don't have to tell us anything. We are gonna get maximum parallel throughput just by having this system. So optimistic execution, that has also been in database world for a long time. But when you do optimistic execution, you have a multi-version in memory data structures that keep track of your execution. If you see a conflict, you roll back a version, then you find the right version, you execute again. There is a round based execution that happens. So this is where you see the graph of scalability where on a 32 core machine, and this is execution only benchmark, but we are able to early, uh, early on, we are able to get 160,000 transactions per second. This is execution only, by the way, this is not the entire network, but that even in one 32 much core machine, getting that number was amazing. Win. Next one, please. And the last one is storage. Storage uh, is generally the classic bottleneck in any distributed system and infra because memory is fast, CPU is fast, disk IO is slow, right? So storage becomes bottleneck invariably. We are doing two things. We batch all the writes in memory. We have highly optimized jellyfish Merkle tree data structure for authenticated, um, uh, for authenticated data structures. And then now we have put sharded databases. So we take rocks DBs, that's in eventual key value store. We have multiple rocks DB instances running in parallel. So we have removed the commit and storage bottleneck that way. So overall, um, that those three are those are the three key areas. This is what we are doing. Next, please. On top of that, we have very low latency. We have less than one second finality. Finality, a lot of chains defined differently. Like uh, chains would say, oh yeah, this as soon as some nodes kind of acknowledge, that means the transaction is not going to fail or eventually the block will be committed or eventually the block will be finalized. But until then, just give an act to the end user. One of the things that Aptos is really, really interested in is to make sure that the conversation has no asterisks, no gotchas. Whatever we say is the final kind of uh, experience that end user has. So once when is a finality, that means like it's end to end. Once you submit the transaction, you get acknowledgement back. That means it's committed on all the nodes. It's, there is no, uh, there's no asterisk. That finality means something else um, and settlement time means something else and eventual commit time means something else. No, there's only one time when you think about latency and that's less than one second. Um, can you go back, sorry? Um, and again, that comes from consensus execution. Yeah, uh, sorry, move on, thank you. And reliability is another thing. Uh, blockchain uh, infra, we are building banks. Right, everybody, there's a hundreds of millions, billions of dollars of assets kind of locked into a blockchain. Uh, the infra needs to be reliable, available 24 uh, seven. So it's been architected for reliability by design. There is a lot of fault tolerances built into blockchain design. But on top of that, what we have learned from building large scale infra, we have this concept called preview net. So every few months, our validator network, all the operators come together they put together a, an environment that looks like mainnet. And on this parallel environment, we just load it up with all sorts of transactions, all sorts of data, all sorts of load. And we observe the behavior. We see how, how, how far we can push the limits. 
And so there are some issues that only happen. There's a minor leak and you let it run for days and then there's suddenly something, you find some very, very uh, interesting corner case. So something that it's not being used in mainnet is not being hit hard. No mainnet is being hit hard right now, but this is a next best thing that we can do. Um, observability, we believe in catching early leading indicators. So if anything is going wrong, our validators catch it as soon as it happens or it, even before it's happening and so they can take corrective actions. And the team's experience, the next one. And so summary, the infra advantage, right? The bottom most layer, again, coming back to the bottom most layer of infra, our advantage is we are leader in the technology, best in class consensus, industry adopted parallel execution. By the way, so block STM was adopted by Polygon. When, they, when we came out, when we released, when we built that, uh, published the paper, uh, Polygon said, hey, this sounds like a great technology. We should have our execution running the same way. They could only get 1.5 to 2X throughput increase because again, you have to think about the entire stack when you build distributed parallel systems. You cannot just change one part and get the same throughput. But again, it's a big win and Polygon openly acknowledged it and we are you know, openly very happy to work with them on that. Um, we have, right now we have 30K plus peak TPS. That is our last benchmark. Again, coming back to the number of being high, publishing only high integrity numbers. In, in benchmarking game in, in the L1 and L2 world, there is just so much like, oh, we published that benchmark and somebody watched it and it's amazing and just trust us. But so then Aptos published a benchmark. We did not only, we not only published the numbers, we published the code, we published the scripts that would actually spin up a network and anybody could reproduce and see the same numbers. So I think, again, we are trying to bring a certain bar. Like if you look at, think about database benchmarking, there are certain standards that everybody follows. And the same standards are, we are trying to make sure that we are following in blockchain world. Again, finally, we talked about always runs, always available. So that's infra advantage. Uh, I can take a minute if you, if anybody wants to have a top of the mind question, or we can keep moving. Yes. Yeah, so if I talk about the shared data, which MPCI is already using it for your blockchain. Okay, but the problem is that they are actually adding in the summary of the transaction rather than the full data. Because if you store full data, data storage needs to cost more. If you add the summary only, because add when you only need to put summary columns, that okay, this has been done or not. Right. Okay, and in what we are doing, because if you are storing all data, then you are making the speed slow, and that cannot work for the most of the apps, because if I talk about P2C apps, it's not possible, because in India, if we talk about 130 CR population, yeah. even 1% is using for 1.3 CR will get. Right. And right. that much data if you put in a web three, it's like, Going to add a cache or it's like going to not even manage that. Yeah, so I think that, uh, got the question. Thank you. And the question is uh, just to repeat uh, if the data, if you start storing all the data in blockchain, it just keeps growing. How do you eventually scale it? For India, kind of population, it already grows uh, too much. So there are two types of data that any blockchain stores one is the transaction data, and even the second one is the state data, right? The transaction gets pruned, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's in some sense temporary. The state you have to manage and you have to make sure that state is available. So that's a one step into managing state is storage sharding. Once you have sharded it, you can start putting it across machines. You can start adding more disks per machine. So at some point, you can start summarizing the data to your point, like at some point you have to start, but the state is very, very important in blockchain, right? You can, you can go back to any, any state uh, and the state is kind of also maintained um, you have to maintain the sanctity because everything is this uh, hash of hash of hash, right? And so I think there is a there is a lot of ways to go before we run out of space. Even 1.3 crore uh, is 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 a very manageable number if you start kind of have a horizontal scalability, right? And the, eventually the thing is how do you pay for that resources that are being used? So yeah, once because it, that's the portion game from Facebook. I'm not asking that too much so because Facebook has the portion. That why not any web two social media app? Because problem is only the data storage thing. Yes. If you talk about web two social media apps, the data storage they are adding is next to impossible even. Yeah. So I think you're right. You're not going to store all of this blobs That's and photos problem. and comments and everything. Then you have to find offline uh, storage, kind of get some sort of hash, put it on on that, and then you find some some way to uh, definitely good point. Cool. Uh, in interest of time, sorry, I, I do want to get to the next point, but. Uh, you mentioned the leader reputation model mm -hmm. where the whole data is not lost, but you need some kind of a metadata. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that what kind of a metadata? 
is going to, to keep the sacrifice. No, you transfer all of the data as the data is coming in. So when the leader proposes the block, they don't have to, the onus is not on the leader to transfer all the data. The data is already reached all the nodes. So leader only transfers metadata because net data is already there. Okay, cool. Let's go to the language advantage, move. So first and foremost, move as a programming language. I want to highlight this and I want to say move, move is secure um, because security is a very, very foundational principle when, uh, when the team design moves from, the, from the scratch. Next please. So there are some security first principles. There's type safety, so you cannot convert between types uh, uh, seamlessly. There is modular encapsulation, so can only, be can only be called from module that define the resource. Ownership and lifetime is a very, very important concept. There are four capabilities for any move, struct, or type that you define, copy, drop, store, and key. And that is only how it can be used based on the type, uh, based on the capability that has been defined. Uh, that really prevents a lot of this, a uh, uh, lot of the issues of how you have defined a particular value and how it's being used in your, uh, in your contract. If it's not copyable, then you are, you are, the compiler itself prevents from any copy from happening. So a lot of this uh, is taken care of at design time, uh, at compile time. And then last, last is referencing uh, safety and references cannot outlive the values it's pointing to. So all the dangling reference problems uh, that, uh, that we have all experienced, uh, it's, it's, it, it kind of goes away. Next please. There is a, we have built in bytecode verification and redundancy. Uh, so move, when once you compile a move program, it generates bytecode. The bytecode itself also is very rich in, some, in the sense that it maintains the type information within the bytecode. So the good, one advantage of that is that once the bytecode then goes to a process called verification and we make sure that all of that, it cannot crash a node because it can hold the network, it cannot overuse the resources, uh, all the completeness of all the properties we talked about. And all of that is verify, uh, make sure that it happens and then it goes to the executor for execution. The last one is paranoid mode. When it comes to safety, we want to be paranoid. And so we run all of the checks again while the program is executing itself to make sure that none of the key safety principles are getting violated. So by definition, Move has built in so much security. Uh, of course, when you build a smart contract, you still want to edit it. There is always human error involved. But there are a lot of this, you, once your comp contracts start getting more and more complex, you, you kind of uh, lose track of all of the subtleties. And there are some corner cases where, where all the wrecked uh, stories come out of. Next, please. Um, there's another question that I get asked a lot of time, uh, which is Aptos move versus, let's call it other chains move. Um, and uh, I think Naresh here, as a, <laughs> uh, it made me, made me chuckle when somebody asked him the question and he's like, hey, this is like comparing Rithik Roshan and Herman Baveja. Uh, like on the surface, it looks very similar, but there is a very, very big quality difference. Uh, how, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that. So Aptos Move has support for global storage. Again, Aptos wants to provide things that is easy for developers. Anytime you have to stop and outside your business logic that you're building, you have to think about the programming language construct that is time wasted. So contracts can read write from the global address space and you do not need to define the ownership of objects up front to get parallelism. And that is supported by this. Uh, support for higher order functions, you can inline them. So this mini Lambda example that I've given here. Contracts get up, uh, graded in place, so a new release comes, Compatibility checks run, contracts get upgraded as long as they're compatible and the upgradability kind of seamlessly rolls in. And that is why we have been able to, I'll talk about upgradability, upgradability separately. And support for formal verification. This is extremely important because anything mission critical, like if you think about um, hospital software or space software, there's a formal verification of that software that happens. Um, in programming language, formal verification is, uh, is a very well-known construct. Entire Aptos framework that we have built on top of Move has been formally verified to not have any issues. So Move supports this formal verification through something called Move Brewer. There is a specification language in which you can define what you are working on. It's very intense, resource intensive, it's time consuming. But if you are working on mission critical things and if you have a lot of assets at stake, it's time very well spent. Um, next Move. So there's Move was built for security and that's why we started with a very small subset. We started with 
uh, a basic outline of what a programming language should look like. We made sure it's super secure. We made sure all of the frameworks are in place. And now it's time to build all the richness. And that is what's going on. So we are bringing the dot syntax rather than this syntax. This is much more easier to read. That's what everybody wants. You don't have for loops. You only have while loops right now. That's coming. Enums are coming. And on top of that, there is a bunch of things coming. Functional overloading, generalizabilities, new move compiler, and new 10x faster assigned integer types. Speaking of new compiler, uh, so move is, we are completely rebuilding the compiler and also VM at some point soon. That brings receivable style function calls. There are a bunch of capabilities. Like if you are building a struct and you want to define an iterator on it, you can do it yourself as a developer. You don't need to worry about move providing that capability or not. Uh, next, please. And then there is more. I'm not going to go through the, all the whole the whole list. And so language advantage. So move is secure by design and is very very feature rich now. So that's the language advantage. Cool. Let's talk about the framework advantage again. In uh, uh, how are we doing on time? What's the time right now? It's three o five. Three o five. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, I want to leave some time for Q and A in the end as well. So frameworks. So on top of move, we have built frameworks. So Goal for framework is to make development faster and simplify UX. Right now, the uh, next please. Upgradability uh, is built in. We have made eight releases in 2023, and this eight eight releases are big releases. We put this fundamental change in our consensus protocol. We have built completely new token standards, and they seamlessly as they, as they are backwards compatible, they get rolled out very easily, and and we are able to move really fast and respond to any demand that we work with some, some developers, they struggle with something, they give us feedback, our team quickly kind of takes in the feedback, looks at the designs, I mean, solution space, and as long as it's generic enough, we put it in place, we, there is an AIP that gets released, community chimes in on AIP, provides their feedback, and then we can quickly roll it out. Uh, one example is Identity Connect, where dApp can authenticate and connect uh, uh, an account can be associated with uh, a social login and a dApp can continue using that social login uh, authentication uh, for the life cycle uh, of the dApp and you cannot, you don't even have to keep re-registering and you can also move it from desktop to mobile. Uh, we have sponsored transactions. So again, if you do not have, uh, users need not hold APT balance in their accounts and user perform operation and fee payer, fee payer covers the utility fees. So this is very, very important when you are trying to onboard large scale uh, users, especially in gaming and other use cases. Next, please. Um, we have a concept of objects where you can really compose all of the capabilities. For example, there is a composable NFT. Um, there is a bunch of these things. I'll keep moving a little bit faster. We can come back to it even after the talk. We have new standards on fungible and non-fungible tokens both. Um, Next one. So I think this actually go back. So I think this AIP 11, there are a bunch of this, whoever is familiar with Solidity, there is a bunch of equivalent of ERC. How does this ERC standard compare to Aptos? All of this is here. That is, uh, you can read the AIP in detail. Uh, I'll not go into all of those details right now. And this is a fungible asset standard uh, for, for the same thing. And now once we have all of this base, we want to make sure that we can build amazing products. Our developers can build amazing products. Next, please. So there are these UX challenges. Blockchains are not databases. It, it takes time. They're slow. You know, remember the 12 world mnemonic. <coughs> Rect is life. There's always deal with these addresses. Zero X, whatever. And then gas fees are sometimes more expensive than petrol itself. And so I think all of this put together just makes for very, very challenging user experience. And also it's variable. Like sometimes it's good. Sometimes it suddenly spikes up. And now you have to worry about it. Right, so all of this, we want to make sure that this, all of these UX challenges get converted into UX advantage. So uh, actually, if you, can you go back one more? Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, next one. Uh, okay, so we are building key rotation support, login with Google and support for key recovery is coming very, very soon or Google or any social login is coming very soon. Use of pass keys. So pass keys are becoming a standard in web two uh, as we speak and it's going being adopted by all the devices. We are, you can sign your transaction using pass keys and that's coming very, very soon. Um, PPR account, we talked about it and always cheap even under load. So when we do this, as I talked about this preview net, we load up the system, we closely monitor the gas market and make sure that it never ever kind of goes beyond a certain point where it's a big surprise for end user. There's a very minor spike that we see. Cool. Next please. I do want to focus on this part because 
and again, this is probably me. So when I, I was, as an engineer, I always kind of, I found cryptography to be very dry. And so any kind of certification, security, authentication, I always look for somebody to take care of it for me so that I can focus on performance and scale. And I found those very, very interesting things. As I'm working on, started my journey with blockchains, I'm finding cryptography to be, cryptography is so powerful. Like so it's almost feels like magic at times. Like, wait, how did you do that? And we have an amazing cryptography team, a few MIT PhDs working on some very, very interesting problems. But in general, I encourage everybody to have a very good foundation, this basic good understanding in cryptography. How do commits work? How do, uh, how do random, how does randomness work? And how can you leverage it to build differentiating capabilities? Because that is where Web3 is going to shine out. For example, so what we have is we have comprehensive Moo libraries, for sure, uh, that's what you would expect. But you can also bring your own arithmetic curves if you are really, really into that thing. Uh, native on-chain randomness that is coming up. And this is, everybody would say, hey, Chainlink has this DRAN. Like, what does this, how is it different? But that DRAN, there are a bunch of issues when you are trying to develop against first. Of, of course, you are kind of putting your trust into a completely different system. So it, if you have a very, very uh, uh, trust critical use case, which you are trusting your validator network to validate that, you're kind of already uh, put that trust, trust somewhere else. It's also slow because Oracle's kind of bring randomness at every certain point. If you want more, much more faster uh, uh, new randomness generation, uh, that is difficult. And also the semantics are different. You have to commit and reveal before you can see what was the randomness versus this with native on-chain randomness. You'll have a move function that you call and say generate randomness as you do in any Web2 application, but it runs in a completely trustless environment. And it is like almost, almost true randomness. Like one could argue, especially the ones who are mathematically inclined that there is no such thing as true randomness in the world. Let's call it almost pseudo randomness is also fine, but not, not true randomness, but almost true randomness. Uh, zero knowledge proofs that we are building. We have a lot of examples uh, where you can build privacy preserving transactions. So the transactions happen between party A and B, but you do not know the amount. And we do it with uh, using bulletproof, range proofs. Uh, they are available for you to build a lot of other capabilities that's, that's available to you right now. Uh, there is also a bunch of other privacy pro preserving natives that uh, we can support. Uh, for example, there are private transactions happening, but there's auditing capabilities available. So your privacy pro is protected, but you are still compliant to a lot of regulations, right? So I think that's, that's another very interesting area. Um, next, please. Um, so, Using that, we want to make sure that whoever is building on Aptos can build differentiating products. Build Web3 products that offer more than Web2. So that is very, very important. We don't want the users to just come for whatever, for some Web3 incentives that you build in because that only lasts so long, right? We have all learned from like our previous experiences. Seamless identity solutions for social retail and others, blazing fast transfers, advanced, advanced cryptography is magical. As I talked about it and I've experienced personally, this is, this is our product, a screenshot from a product that we had built in kind of three days. There's a canvas, we wanted to celebrate our one year launch. We built a canvas and said, hey guys, come and draw on the canvas. We released it to the community. And we had like, you can only draw so certain number of pixels at a time. And if you see initially like this beautiful designs are emerging until it became a complete chaos. Because then it was globally, it became viral. But it was very interesting to see how people are coming together and completing each other's designs and kind of collaborative creation is, is, is uh, it was a reminder it's so core to our human values that uh, rather than people coming in we are worried that people would come in and start writing things that are offensive start writing things that are politically incorrect we'll have to do content moderation none of that happened we had like global community coming in yes at some point it became chaotic but you feel like it's beautiful chaos and there are some amazing numbers that we saw all right, and when you talk about Aptos Advantage, there's a lot more, right? So there's a speed advantage that because of that, in some sense, we are future-proof. As the demand comes in, as a new case use case emerges, we can quickly respond and put it in production versus traditionally blockchains take have a much, much, much longer upgrade cycles. Uh, we have an amazing community advantage. As I mentioned, we want to, we have a lot of people who are building on Aptos in the back right now. You can talk to them. We want to provide individual partnership. When you are a developer, we don't have, we don't say, hey, yeah, here's a developer pool. And we talk to like this big company. We have big company partnerships. Microsoft is a big partner. We are talking to a bunch of other web two giants. And especially because we came out of Facebook, there's a lot of 
kind of uh, you know either connections some pedigree some credibility because of that we are getting a lot of traction with really big names but we are equally interested in making sure that our experience working with big partners and working with an individual developer should be pretty much at par there's a lot of funding support there is uh, we have an amazing vc network there is a company called econia labs they started with us uh, just around the time we are launching they were in our palo alto office sitting with us and we introduced them to our VC network and they they raised 6.5 million dollars and that was again that was in bear market right so um and they just launched in production uh and and it's a it's an amazing launch uh so that's the partnership advantage yeah in summary like you know i want to now throw a question back to the, the, this group that how are, do you want to leverage it i guess you talk about infra language framework capabilities um and i don't know uh how uh it's one of the maybe very very few chains, uh, if any at all. That is the combination of all. And uh, yeah, there are them. You can just with this. I invite you guys to build with Aptos. There are some links. You can connect with me. You can connect with the network. Uh, and uh, with that, I would love to take some questions. Yes, sir. Of course, I have one is. Yeah, the first question I have is into. Uh, because that's a major problem that if you build on one net and you are not able to access another internet, how will you make sure that Web3 is going to survive? Now? Yeah, yeah, I think this that's is a, a basic question. problem. I think interoperability keeps coming up. We have definitely, um, especially, you know, EVM and EVM compatibility. It's a, it's a question we get all the time. Technically, uh, it's very, very doable. Uh, we can get, we talked about the virtual machine that we have. We can replace it with EVM. Uh, and uh, we can plug it in. It can also benefit from all the parallelism. So I mean, there we would be getting the throughput on solidity contract execution, something similar to what we are seeing on the numbers reported. So that would be amazing as well. Um, the two things. One is that we do believe that there is a lot of uh, advantage in using Move, right? So Move and kind of if it also depends on how you see the blockchain journey. Do you think the Web3 journey, do you think we are already just starting? Do you think we are in the middle of the journey already? Do you think everything is already, a lot of standards are already established or we are still building the standards, right? So all of these questions need to be answered uh, and we want to kind of strategically make sure. So we'd love to talk to people if you think that EVM compatibility is very important for your use case. You are building something, you'd love to build on Aptos, but you want compatibility. I would love to talk to you right after this talk. Yeah, definitely. Because when you build for real world application, you need compatibility in some level. Because you cannot uh, be limited to some circle. Like if you're building on social media, if mm -hmm. I talk about. So when you're building on social media, you need one internet. Now you cannot have five internet emerging and then plug in and play. Right. That's like a challenge Correct. for all. Yeah. And the okay. way to solve the problem is to build standards. Yeah. Right. So and as, as long as the standards are being followed, uh, the interoperability comes as a kind of byproducts of everybody following the same standards. So I think that is interoperability is exactly required. The way to get interoperability, there are multiple ways. I would love to talk to you more about that. Yeah. Sure. And uh, another question I have is regarding the so lazy can I take One more question here, yeah. and then yeah, I'll feel it loud. Uh, and I'll repeat your question. Yeah. So uh, basically, I want to know more about the ecosystem. Right now, the apps we are building involves a lot of ecosystem partners. For example, you mentioned Chainlink is very crucial for one of the Oracle clouds. The latter is useful for limit orders, and then there yeah. are swap routers, yeah. aggregators. Like one inch and everything. Recently, one inch moved from V4 to V5, and all of the back they didn't even provide the backup package. So everybody acting, you know, scrape up and developer portals and everything acting. How are you building this ecosystem? Because suppose I build a DeFi application, I've got the contracts and everything, but who's gonna give me verifiable prices? And even if they're coming, at what stage they are? Because uh, if one inch comes to Aptos, we'll have to see how they're operating as well. Uh, because these are the core building blocks you get anywhere, like Dex, building, borrowing, chain link, uh, limit orders, and everything, automation. Right. So they're moving in a different direction. I think Aptos is catching up a lot on the infra. But if you see Gelato as now an SDK for OpenStack, you can launch your chain. They have function, uh, serverless functions also coming up that mm. you want to automate and all these things. Right. And I see that's very far in terms of the ecosystem right yeah. now. What is happening to build that? So that we can actually build applications user cases. Yeah, that's a that's a great call out, and it's specifically in the DeFi space. That is the space that you mentioned. Again, the question is like how we are building the ecosystem, and maybe some examples were more DeFi centric. Uh, I think that's a great uh, great question, and it's a great call out as well. This is somewhere where we are still 
kind of building out our DeFi strategy that is more very, very clear. Uh, internally, we have a very good uh, uh, next step lay, laid out, but it's not clear to the ecosystem yet and the developers who are building on top of it. We have a bunch of these things that uh, that are lined up. Uh, we there is a there are some partnerships that we are working on, but partnerships also take time. The integrations take time. Um, there are I mean ecosystem is a whole kind of complete spectrum of get the partners that that generally developers want to build with. Make sure those partners are successful. The way they build on Aptos is successful. Right? It's not just partnership or integration. You are in integrated and you are done. No, you have to make sure that. Um, so I think it's a very broad question. Um, and I would love to connect you with somebody uh, who's specifically looking after that. Uh, his name is Bashar. He's coming. Uh, he's going to be here like later in the evening. So we can have a more uh, detailed follow-up. I'll mention one example here. Because mm -hmm. if you ZKVM is picking up good pace, people know that ZKVM is there. Fitzwaracal is the use there. Um, it is sometimes the price is three days pay. Um, and as a ZKVM system, they have no control over that. But if you build an application on top of it, you can't do anything about it, right? Mm. If the price itself is three days pay, now you going to change. Right. And right. then you have to allow the contracts to take that and the security risk that if the price is fail. It's DeFi, the price can just fail, but then you can't cross check. They don't have a co-op system built, uh, which very few people know about that. Why Uniswap co-op or Eckel was also important. A lot of people know Nexus that launched not have their own co-op. So uh, this is like totally not in the hands of the chain. But how are you going to get people that are trusted? If you get something like Fit there, right? right? The price is three days late. Right. The price is not going to do anything. Right. It's a right. thing. No, I, I, I think absolutely spot on. Great call out. Um, I have not spent that much time in DeFi space myself. Uh, but I would love to follow up on this and make sure that there are, there are some good answers that we communicate openly uh, to the whole community. Cool. Yeah, so I have a uh, last question that is regarding the lazy minting technique. Are you guys supporting that? Because that can save a lot of gas fee. Lazy and that's not required even to pay a gas fee even for the user. Lazy minting. Uh, yeah. Tell me more. Uh, what so it's, it's like uh, uh, putting the code on the off chain and uh, let the NFT be saved. So when somebody comes for the bidding, then the NFT only will be minted. So to save the gas flow, so that it's like there's no NFT if there is no demand. Yeah, I think uh, that's a, that's a good question. Technically speaking, I don't see a reason why it cannot be supported. Uh, I don't remember any AIP around it that we have published. But this is something like again to up to the my previous point. If this is something the community wants, something we can very very quickly iterate and provide support for. So it's this. Gas yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's what I thought. Yeah. It's, 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 but if. It's pretty low, but again, if community wants and if they think that there is a real value, we can, we can make it happen. Yeah, we would love to uh, check that out because I have a conference with one of the NFT artists mm. and they have uh, this problem that, okay, we pay the gas free upfront and make an NFT, but nobody buy it. Then what's the yeah, but problem think, that's, yeah. they are saying that if, to can you make it the gas properly yeah. out and of again, the system? Like, what is the collection size? How many yeah. NFTs you are minting? You can mint some, and if Aptos is really, really cheap, and so minting some is not a burden for anybody. Uh, and so again, is there a true demand, or it's something that an experience on a different chain, which is kind of now translating on Aptos? Yeah, definitely love to connect. Cool. Thank you. Yes, Rishabh. Sorry, get the. Hello. But yeah. you still have to speak out loud. That is only yeah. for the camera. <laughs> so you mentioned about uh, social logins being provided natively by the foundation. Mm -hmm. So uh, with Web3 or they themselves mentioned that it is not a truly uh, non-custodial solution. Uh, it is pseudo-custodial. So will you all be able to provide that true non-custodial experience? Because whenever social logins come up, the major factor, especially in the decentralized space, becomes that then there's no decentralization. So is there any way you all are thinking about it or tackling that so that we as users and people who are we selling off to, because social logins are something where we are trying to adopt the major web two population. Yes. Are we yes. able to provide that true decentralization to them through them? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point, uh, and it's a, it's a it truly is a trade off in that sense, right? That uh, for web two experience and to quickly onboard a lot of web two uh, users, especially like you have any uh, you have a game uh, that you have developed, and there are now a lot of players who want to play, but they don't want to have an account or they want to manage an account, and for that purpose, it becomes a very very clear use case. We also have provide the recovery and all. Once you start having real assets of value, right, then you want to kind of really make sure that you have more control over it. Yeah. So I think having right now, the answer is that because we have both, it kind of covers the spectrum. At the same time, we do believe that there will be that gray area, right, where you have both and then there is the centralization risk that, that comes with it. And so again, trusting a third party like Google, 
has a centralized message. So I think that's a fair question. But again, in, in terms of like, it's currently, it's more important to make sure that the UX yes. is really, really cool, really easy, really seamless to onboard a lot of users. And then at some point, make sure once you have the custody and then you're yes. focusing on that, you give the power to your, say, let's call them power users. Right? Yeah, but this is approved like a signing kind of a transition with Google, right? It right. can be revoked definitely. It can be revoked, yeah. It's a trust model is already there, I don't see. Uh, because the user can remove Google login ID. The user account. can remove, but I think sometimes when you onboard with that, um, a user can remove, but again, that's a, you have to be advanced user, right? You are just playing a game, you signed it with Google, you have now collected some in-game assets. Uh, you are not even maybe fully familiar with the system. So again, as, as I mentioned, it's there, but at some point, there is some third party risk that you are kind of uh, taking on when you're stealing recovery. Yeah, right. something, yeah, something like that. How difficult to migrate Soldi to move? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. How difficult the question was, how difficult is it to migrate from Solidity to move? Um, and, and the answer um, it's getting more and it's getting more and more easy as we are doing that. We have some of our ecosystem partners who have already done that. They have told us unless there are some specific solidity libraries, if you have a smart a smart contract or a collection of contracts that have used certain libraries which are not available in Move ecosystem, uh, and we are kind of completely removing that uh, that list. We are providing equivalent support. Um, from Move, the just core point of view, it's very, very easy. Uh, Move is very intuitive, very easy to write. It's more like, hey, if you have written this solidity contract in a certain way, depending on a certain solidity library, what exactly is the mapping? And we are going to very soon publish a very comprehensive tutorial. We are working on a, a large scale migration with some of our developers and they are documenting everything. So every step will be well documented and our goal is to make it uh, super easy and super seamless. Hello, sir. Mm -hmm. Is it working? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to ask a question. Will the TPS drop if the network upscales? The number of nodes joining the Aptos network, will the TPS drop after that? Um, sorry, could you come in a little bit? Yeah, TPS drop I heard. Yeah, yeah. so if the number of networks joining the Aptos network, mm -hmm. if the number scales, mm -hmm. will the TPS drop? Is there a bottle, bottleneck? To what do you mean by networks joining? What is uh, Nodes network? joining. Nodes joining. joining the yeah. Network. yeah, no, so I think, okay, that's a great question. As, a, as an infra, you have a certain number of nodes and you scale, continue scaling out the number of nodes, does at some point TPS drop? Because again, the consensus becomes a little bit more expensive. Currently, Aptos has 120 nodes. Uh, about uh, 250, 300 nodes, or even up to 500 nodes, there should not be any TPS drop. Um, we are also we also believe in like having decentralization, which is more across the board. So we are focusing on Nakamoto coefficient, which is right now we have about 19. We are going to hit 30 by end of 23. We are having state decentralization, hardware decentralization. So putting it all together, we don't see any uh, real issue in more nodes joining the network. Uh, at, uh, at the same time, also like some, some networks like Solana and all, we have a lot of nodes. But what's happening is like eventually you want only a certain stake to vote, right? So a lot of the nodes just become more like pool nodes because they are not really actively participating in the consensus as much. They are becoming like non-voting validators or things like that, right? So the core vote comes from the core set of uh, high stake nodes and high stake nodes when you look at those networks are again still very, very small. So I think any anywhere around 200 would be enough decentralization from our point of view that should bring. So, so thousand nodes coming in would be a bottleneck. At thousand nodes. Yeah, thousands of nodes coming in. So so again so we are not so there is going to be thousands of nodes we don't see that being the paradigm under which we operate there will be thousands of nodes as total node deployment because there will be full nodes which okay. will be constantly streaming data from the network and serving it out. But the high stake nodes the high stake node should be 200 300 mostly that that's how, that's that's how it ends up being anyway uh, when you when you look at any chain which has more than those number of nodes thank you yeah. two questions actually okay uh, sorry uh, how are we, how are we doing on time right now 330 uh, okay Three yeah sure sure yeah uh, one regarding the random number generator mm -hmm. api3 also has a quantum random number generator i think which one api3 api3 was very famous for the data so they also have a random number generator. What was the advantage of having something that is inbuilt one? Uh, you can answer the next question. So I don't know API three. I mean API three for. Um... API three is the name of the protocol actually. Oh, okay. Uh, they used to run, run air nodes actually, and those 
Okay, so I, I'm not very familiar with that part. Uh, I think this is truly natively generating random numbers is, is going to become more and more common. The reason why it's not common right now is proof of stake networks require very, very advanced cryptography if your next stake distribution is not even. So Definity is the only protocol that supports native random number generation because they have equal stake distribution. So all the nodes have same stake. So when you do that, you can distribute uh, uh, the, the publicly verifiable secret sharing. Um, uh, your distributed key gen is, is very, very easy. Uh, Aptos is the only first proof of stake network which does not have, which has an uneven stake. But we are still figuring, uh, we have figured out a way. Once we publish the paper, there is a lot of people will follow. And the reason is that what I mentioned, like, A, again, you are relying, if you, you don't want to rely on any third party. But API 3, I'm not sure that protocol, if it, it, it already had, had that and what worked and what didn't work, maybe something else is in there. And then the second ecosystem partner comes from exchange. There are uh, companies like QuickNote and then Aragon support as well for you know, not this level, yeah. but when you go to a very high level of data understanding and you know data supplies, there were flip side and everything that was supplying data. Right. So how is this ecosystem played for Aptos right now? Oh, we have all of that support. We have, I think, we have flip side. We have a uh, quick node. We have a bunch of node providers. We have a bunch of analytics providers. Bunch of uh, API providers. Uh, so we have a pretty good list. That's a pretty comprehensive list. Cool. Cool. Anybody else? Any other questions? All right, cool. Then we can wrap up and I'll be around. See you soon. Okay, thank you.